right, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sarah Fuchs, and I am a senior specialist in the community education department at MDA. We are thrilled to have you join us for today's webinar on equipment and assistive technology. This learning series is a part of our larger MDA community education program, which focuses on bringing the neuromuscular disease community together around education and resources. Be sure to visit the community education section on mda.org for updates and upcoming events. We are recording today's event and we'll be posting it to the website for on-demand viewing at a later date. Please know that all phone lines have been muted but you can still ask questions. We'll have a Q&A session at the end of today's webinar with today's presenters. Simply use the chat feature to type in your questions and feel free to type in your questions and send them in as you think of them and they will be addressed at the end. For nearly 75 years, MDA has led the way in funding research to accelerate the development of new treatments expanding access to care and clinical trials through the MDA Care Center Network, and advocating for access and inclusion for the neuromuscular disease community. MDA delivers its mission through research, advocacy, access to care, education, recreation, and engagement. Since its inception, MDA has invested more than $1.1 billion in neuromuscular disease research. MDA funds projects through throughout the drug development round, excuse me, the drug development spectrum from early discovery through translational stages and infrastructure support for clinical trials. At MDA care centers located at over 150 top medical institutions nationwide, people living with neuromuscular disease and their families find more than medical expertise. They experience a community fiercely dedicated to advancing access to care and nurturing hope. MDA's advocacy work focuses on support for accelerated approvals and novel research, access to healthcare, treatments, independent living, newborn screening, accessible air travel, and more. This focus plays a vital role in shaping laws and policies that support the needs of people living with rare neuromuscular diseases. Our community education and recreation programs are designed to connect individuals and families. We are committed to building a nurturing environment where our members can share experiences, triumphs, and challenges. In 2023, we offered over 40 educational programs, over 20 summer camps, and dozens of other community activities, both in person and virtually. If you haven't done so already, uh, we invite you to join the MDA community by registering with us and registering is free. Now it's my pleasure to introduce today's speakers, Tom Simon and Katie Matheny. Tom and Katie will be presenting together on two topics, mobility equipment and navigating services. We will split our learning into two sections and have a Q&A session after each presentation. Katie Matheny is an occupational therapist with over 30 years of experience in neuro neurological rehabilitation and has worked with ALS patients for more than two decades. She is part of the team of providers in the Texas Neurology ALS Clinic and delivers in-home private care to help people living with ALS improve their quality of life and manage the challenges of the disease. Tom has extensive experience and knowledge as an ATP and has been working in the field for 21 years. He has been a registrant of the International Registry of Rehabilitative Technology Suppliers for 18 years and has served as the VP um, of the INRRTS. He, deserve, or he serves on the Board of Directors for the Muscular Dystrophy Association one of his passions includes working with the ALS population and, and has worked with two multidisciplinary ALS clinics in the Dallas-Fort Worth area for 20 years. He has served thousands of clients with ALS during this time. Tom is also passionate about working with clients who have muscular dystrophy, serving as a camp counselor for 31 years. 
Tom currently lives in Texas and enjoys traveling the world with his wife, Stacy, always exploring. Thank you both for being here today, and I will now turn the time over to you. So here are our objectives. So we have uh, three objectives on this um, process also is explain different types of insurance coverage relevant to mobility equipment and assistive technology. Clarify eligibility criteria, coverage limitations, and documentation requirements. Um, we'd also like to set out to highlight the steps in the process of getting the equipment you need and discuss in using resources available to you. As an OT, I tend to think, I think I mentioned before, there are a lot of possibilities within reach, and I want them to be easily reachable for everyone. Um, but unfortunately, that road gets um, is a little complicated. Um, it gets a little bit difficult, and that's where having therapy, ATP um, providers, and all of that collaborating for this makes a huge um, difference. So finding those professionals who focus on your disease-specific needs is ideal, and MDA is one of those that has great information. Absolutely, and we're going to also educate participants on advocacy strategies to effectively communicate with insurance providers and healthcare professionals including navigating the appeals process for denied claims. When we were sitting down to talk about this uh, presentation, um, it probably is one of the most important topics that we can talk about. Um, you know, equipment is fun, mobility keeps us going, but actually being able to get the equipment funded and, 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 and even advocating for ourselves when we can't get it funded, is so, so important and it's difficult for a lot of us to be able to do that. So hopefully after this little presentation, um, you'll be able to do um, that for yourselves. So. <laughs> I just have a break here. Yeah, this is our wonderful little slide break. We're gonna explain, highlight and educate. I think we both struggled with the fact that although this is very important, it also can be a little boring. So, yes, that, yeah, I forgot, to talk, I forgot to talk about that. This is very, uh, very boring <laughs> stuff, but it's very important. Um, types of insurance coverage for mobility equipment and assistive technology. Um, so we're not, we're not really talking about, we're not talking about the Aetna's and the Blue Cross and all, and, and all that other stuff. This, so here are the funding sources, Medicare, Medicaid. We have HMO replacement plans, Medicare HMO replacement plans and coded items. Um, so we're gonna basically talk about the coded items, not something that is out of pocket or anything. We also have private insurance. A lot of us have private insurance. Um, and you know that, that is the Aetna, the Blue Cross, and so on and so forth. There are also alternative payers, um, the VA, the Veterans Administration. Um, in Texas, we have um, TWC, which is Texas Workforce Commission, and they basically fund things for people who are trying to find work or people who are trying to stay employed. And then we have uh, an organization called DARS, Department of Aging Rehabilitative Services. Um, and those are people who, um, that's an organization that you can apply for. And even though it's a state organization, it's federally funded. So um, there are also disease specific organizations that can help pay for things. Um, they're not necessarily called insurance, but maybe they have some type of a grant application that you can apply for. Um, how, do you, how do you find these through internet searches, um, clinic relationships, and also don't forget um, a very important member of your team should be the social worker um, at your clinic. It does even if you don't go to a multidisciplinary clinic, each doctor that you go see has some type of social worker in their practice. So, very important person. So. The clicker is definitely lagging behind. So just <laughs> FYI, everybody, I am pushing the button for the slide to change, but sometimes it's not going. So what are coverage limitations? Obviously, we talked about in the other presentation, co-pays and deductibles. Um, that might, you know, if, if you have a very high deductible, that might be a limitation. Um, if you have co-pays, um, that might be a limitation. You can find all of that information on the website of your insurance carrier. Um, out of pocket stop loss. Um, once again, that is the maximum that your insurance says that you have to pay before they cover any item at 100%. As long as that item has been approved and it is something that they actually cover. 
and you have medical necessity, of course. And um, denial by parts. Yeah, that's what you were talking about. Just basically that um, each part, each component of these, um, this equipment has to be justified. And so often um, parts of that equipment will be denied, but other parts will be approved. And that gets into a really complicated and honestly frustrating portion of this, but it's a reality that um, based on the codes and based on the justifications, um, you have to be very specific and very detailed in that. Yeah, so I just want to give you a quick example. So as an ATP working with um, ALS clients for many years, I know that they need a special type of cushion to sit on, right? Now, um, they might not have any history of pressure sores. They might not have any um, spinal uh, symmetries or any type of uh, tilt. Any, they might not have anything they need that's pressure relieving and positioning cushion. Also, we have a special ergonomic back that we like to put on the chairs. Well, Medicare, uh, in their infinite wisdom, oh, I shouldn't have said that, um, <laughs> says that we are not covering those items. But as an ATP, I know that my client, my ALS client needs those items. So, um, th so there's ways that we can actually provide those items to that client because that's exactly what they need, even though Medicare is not gonna fund those items. So. It goes back to like that long-term versus short-term. Like, could you sit in that seat for that time without those types of cushions? Yes, but the reality is we're looking at the big picture, the long-term aspects is there's going to be a change in cushion in the future, um, just based on seeing how that's happened over the years, you know, that's the hard part we have to justify. Um, and here we're going to talk about some of the eligibility criteria. So, you know, establishing the need for equipment for um, mobility equipment means that we're looking at non functional ambulation. We're um, in the prior presentation, we talked about being unsteady, unsafe, or having extreme fatigue or falls when you're trying to do mobility related um, ADLs or activities. Um, Assistive technology, we're talking about here, you know, the, the things that aid you in performing functions that, you know, might really honestly not be possible without them. That may be your communication devices, feeding devices, um, door controls, light, light controls, robotic arms. We've got lots of different things in that, um, that, ca that category. Um, but it all comes down to this local coverage determination. Um, and that is the LCD is um, a decision that's made by Medicare about the items they will reimburse or cover. I um, mean, it really is intended to guide, you know, providers, therapists, um, equipment providers, the suppliers that um, have the equipment and those of you that are trying to get equipment. It's meant as a guide, like to help you look at those requirements and we'll look at those in just a minute to really bottom line, make sure something is medically necessary. Um, and really to to see if it's eligible for reimbursement. So we have an example of that. Yeah, I just wanted to oh, just talk a little bit yeah. about it. I want to talk about assistive technology. So in our world, um, Katie and Katie and my world, <laughs> assistive technology could be something as simple um, as a, uh, a, a, you know, those little squeezers that help you undo a uh, jar lid, right? That's assistive technology. It doesn't have to be the $50,000 robotic arm that you control with a joystick. Assistive technology is anything that help, that aids you in performing functions that might otherwise be difficult and possible. And so even mobility, even the group three power chairs are assistive technology. <laughs> K5, I mean, yeah. isn't a transport chair really assistive technology? It is, I, I mean, think we, you know, when we look at the eligibility aspects of it, um, all those things, and again, go back to an out-of-pocket expense. And so we kind of get into the conversation of their, everything is assisting you. It just yeah. comes down to the terminology. Yeah. And that's the hard thing is that we have to, abide by these LCDs and what um, insurance or, you know, really quite honestly, Medicare sets as reasonable and necessary. <laughs> and so it, yeah. Yeah, so we, um, okay. so when we were putting this together, we had a little conversation about which, <laughs> so local coverage determination, the Medicare created these rules, you know, 25, 30 years ago, and they haven't changed many of them. Some have changed. Um, over the years for different reasons, but the cane has pretty much been the same way for a very long time. So, cane, the, the, the actual local coverage determination is L33733. This is actually a Reader's Digest version, 
now I'm showing my age now, <laughs> of, um, of an LCD. If you actually look L33733 up, just if you want to just Google that, if you don't have anything to do, it's going to be about maybe two and a half pages long. So for a cane, this is what Medicare decided would get a cane covered. Mobility limitations impairs one or more of these MRADLs, mobility-related activities of daily living in the home. In the home is very important. They didn't talk about going to the bank, going to the grocery store, taking a walk with the dog. They talked about in the home. Increased time to complete. Yesterday, I could walk that in 10 minutes. Now, I, it takes me 20 minutes. Um, is there a time set? Or is that a PT function where you have a there are time tests time to tests prove um yeah your gait um yeah. and your functional efficiency mobility. yeah yeah mm -hmm. um greater risk of injury without the cane so that means I'm more susceptible to falling and hurting myself um safely use a cane or crutch to resolve mobility deficit so what they're saying is that you have these deficits but can you safely use the cane mm -hmm. if the cane causes more options for you to trip and fall then they're not going to cover the cane for you um, and denied if not reasonable and necessary. Yeah, I'd like to speak to that a little yeah. bit. So, I, you know, we can go on a dictionary dive on what reasonable means, but when you kind of boil it down, it's what's justifiable. Um, you know, we as therapists have to provide some justifiable uh, measures that show that you need this. And so, not just speaking of a cane, but as we move along the different things, there are balance tests, there's manual muscle tests, there's things that give those qualifying, justifying um, uh, indicators that you need these things. And then when you talk about necessary, that without it, you couldn't participate in those daily activities that you do moving around your home on your own. Um, so without a cane, in this instance, we're talking about if if you didn't have that, you would not be safe and you would be at risk for fall. And so we have to kind of fall into this reasonable um, that there's not something less complex. There's nothing really less complex than a cane. <laughs> Just about, no, that is but, the, but or the, there's not something else that would make that better for you. And so, you know, that's what we're we're talking about. Here. Yeah, so there's an LCD for every piece of equipment that we talked about so far today. There's an LCD for manual wheelchairs, uh, K5s, power wheelchairs, the tilt and recline aspect of power chairs. There's an LCD for all the accessories for power wheelchairs. There's, um, there. if you just look up Medicare LCDs, you'll find a whole list of them. And, and once again, it, it, it's all about um, the algorithmic approach to justifying what is needed and cane is the very very first mobility device that um listing. and hopefully it's the last <laughs> no 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 um i think it's great it's great awesome. um so then um moving on from here um we talk about those documentation requirements so we kind of mentioned it a little bit um but we've broken it up into three categories. This could probably be done in a number of different ways. But if we're looking at light DME, Tom, what are we talking about? Light DME is your. Yeah, it's like your um, Hoyer lifts, um, manual wheelchairs, um, mm -hmm. gate equipment, shower chair, yeah. ADL stuff. Yeah, sorry, I jumped ahead in that. So we've got light, the categories were light DME, complex. Um, Man, I missed on that complex rehab technology and then assistive technology. That's kind of how we're we're trying to encapsulate these so that we get into an understanding of that. And so, um, yeah. So when we look at those documentation requirements, each of these things kind of has their own peculiar specific thing that's needed. And so if we look at manual wheelchairs or maybe based on the slide there, let's look at ADL equipment, um, your shoehorn, your doorknob turner, your um, handheld shower head. Um, you know, I'm trying to think of different things like that. These are smaller pieces of, of equipment that make your day better, that honestly make it possible for you to still be independent. Those come from therapy recommendations or things that you see people um, share what's worked for them and that's helpful as well. Um, but those are all out of pocket. Um, they're just things that are not coded by Medicare and that are not going to be um, covered um, no matter in general how hard we try. Right? right. When we look at gate equipment like your canes, your walkers, your braces, those things. 
you need a therapist recommendation for those, or it is beneficial for you to have a therapist recommendation for those, and then um, a doctor's prescription. Um, but generally, those are things you're going to buy on your own or, you know, through uh, the therapy connection that you have or whatever in an, uh, a, an equipment provider. Um, <clears throat> uh, you've got the Hoyer lifts and, or I'm sorry, Hoyer lifts, hospital beds. I skipped manual wheelchairs there, sorry. But Hoyer lifts and hospital beds, that goes again to having a therapist working with you who says these things are going to be helpful for you for based on whatever reasons. Um, and uh, then a doctor's prescription is needed and letters of medical necessity are needed. And that's where, similar to the LCD, those codes, there's guidelines to um, the language um, that is beneficial to the person who needs it. And so we're looking there at really more your lowest level of function versus your highest level. And that's kind of hard for some therapists to to bridge that gap. I want to think positively of what you can do. But when we're talking about equipment, we have to rest in some of those areas where um, on a day to day basis, you can't do these things well on your own safely or with the energy that you have or the function that you have. And so we have to talk in those ways in those letters of medical necessity. Um, and manual wheelchairs um, go into another realm of needing, you know, the face to face that um, you have with your doctor who recognizes what your physical status is, your medical status. Um, it's uh, then there's also the therapy or mobility evaluation that then looks at your physical function, your muscle strength, your ability to do things with or without that type of equipment, um, and then doctor's orders for that, the prescription for it. Those things are required for that. Um, and then I'm gonna let you talk about the shower chair because it frustrates me a lot. <laughs> <laughs> let me put a little asterisk by the shower chair because um, it is not funded by um, insurance and Medicare kind of led, uh, led the way on this many years ago. They, they don't fund anything that gets wet um, because, and this is ridiculous, it's not the least common way to take a shower or a bath. Um, uh, and you might say, well, what is, Tom? Uh, well, the bed bath, you know, that's what they, they kind of look at. Wipes. Wipes, yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's, I mean. The, yeah, so it, it's, so a shower chair can be something very simple, like we had talked about, four legs, adjustable four legs, and a seat, no back. It could have a back. It could be a sliding bench. It, there's so many different things. Like I said, go to Google, just put in a uh, shower chair, rolling shower chair, and you'll find thousands of different options. Um, yeah, uh, <laughs> like okay. you, I'm with you. I saw the yeah, post I saw about the posting, who's uh, on the board yeah. and how they take a shower, right? Yeah, exactly. It, it, yeah, it, that's another topic for another day. Yeah. Katie, you don't want to get us started. No. But, um, but a shower chair is something, a shower is one of the most beautiful things in our lifetime. If we can stand in under the water and the hot water can wash all the troubles of the day away mm -hmm. um, and we can step out, dry off and be clean and restart. I mean, people ask me, hey, Tom, how was your day? I said, I was great. I got up and I stood in the shower mm -hmm. and they look at me and they go, what are you talking about? <laughs> and I said, you do not understand what I do every day, right? And how and, and exactly. what it means to be able to take a shower. So I think it should be one of those inalienable rights, right? <laughs> They're listed. I mean, yeah. it's something we we are proponents for it being covered. It's just that's the frustrating part of it. It's just yep. And um, it, one day we'll get that changed. So just there you go. Stay with right. <laughs> All right. Let's go to the next one. I'm still screaming and shouting. So we're going to talk about documentation, documentation requirements for complex rehab technology. Um, so we're talking about a complex rehab technology. Um, sometimes it's referred to as CRT, um, but we just like to call it complex rehab technology. So this is a documentation requirements for a power mobility device. And this is typically any type of power mobility, whether it's a scooter, whether it's a uh, group three, um, anything that's covered, this, this, obviously, we're not talking about folding wheelchairs um, that you can buy online. So you have to have a, a, a prescription face to face with the doctor, and we kind of put those in there. But the, you go see your physician, they document in their clinical note that you need a power mobility device based on blah, blah, blah. 
they can say sometimes I think we we may not have talked through that as much but sometimes this is also coming from the therapy perspective like go see your doctor talk to your doctor so there can be some prior steps to the time of the face to face where the doctor's made aware that um, this is a recommendation before yeah that. that's a great point these are not necessarily in a chronological order yeah yeah close, that's a very good point <laughs> um, you get feedback okay so. um so once we see the doctor, even in the doctor's note, he could say refer to um, therapists for mobility evaluation. So then you go to OTPT, who specializes in mobility evaluation. Yeah. Excuse me. Can you go to a home health PT? Well, if they have never done a mobility evaluation, um, some of the papers that we use here are six to 15 pages long. And so it's very daunting for them. And and as an ATP, I always want to use someone who has experience in mobility evaluations because that's going to make the funding process so much easier to get approved. Um, what does the OTPT do? Yeah, so what that documentation uh, consists of is really specific information about you, your physical status, um, your muscle strength, your function of your all your limbs, your arms and legs. Um, and then how you do things. And again, we come back to some specific parameters of the manual muscle testing um, for an OT, um, the grip and pinch strength that you have. Um, those can be markers that are helpful to justify it. Um, going to like a lesser type of equipment or type of wheelchair would not suit your needs or, or be the best choice for you for what reasons. That's where we have to kind of justify that as well. And then of course, um, falls are a big part that we have to um, document that, you know, unfortunately, a lot of people try to go from, you know, walking and falling a lot before they get into these power chairs or into the right mobility equipment. Um, so documenting the medical necessity, um, just like in um, what we were talking about with the LCD and, and different things, it takes looking at the broad spectrum of honest and true something of less complexity is not going to meet your needs. And so we have to explain in ways that the document, the, the evaluation form um, asks of us um, why those other pieces of equipment won't work. And then we go into the equipment justification for each component for the drive type of drive control, the type of cushion, the type of um, whether you have tilt or recline, we have to we have to justify each piece of that based on um, your physical status. Um, and again, a lot of that means looking at on your worst days, um, what you are able to do or have trouble doing. And so then we have the equipment that supports it so that your worst days aren't so bad. You know, that's what we're trying to make better, um, but we have to justify each element of that. And it's definitely a collaborative team approach. So what does that mean? So work with um, the, the entire multidisciplinary team at a clinic or, you know, back in March of 2020, we had a little event that happened. Mm -hmm. And so we had no clinics to go to. So um, we started doing telehealth and as an ATP, I would be in the home and the therapist would be at their home on video. And we created a way to actually do telehealth visits. And, you know, what is that almost four and a half years later now, we're still doing telehealth, not quite as much, but there is such an underserved population that never made it to the doctor that are now getting seen and getting pieces of equipment that can get, make them independent, safe and comfortable again. So. Too far. I know. I know. Okay, so the documentation requirements, again, we're talking about here with assistive technology. And um, although we talked about things being assistive in so many ways, these are kind of your high tech pieces, your communication devices, um, your feeding devices. Um, uh, well, let me go back. Like in communication devices in our clinic, um, we do. Um, rely on the speech language pathologist to be the primary lead in starting that. And so it can vary from from uh, clinic to clinic or in different settings who leads that, but the speech therapist does that. She makes the recommendations, gets the face-to-face -face and the doctor's prescription, and then has specific forms that are very detailed as well um, to getting that justification um, to the 
the funding sources. Um, feeding devices and robotic arms, there's excellent options out there. And um, people have asked about other you know, devices and things that are out there, where can we get this funding? Unfortunately for those, there's just not funding and it's really important for you to um, find alternate sources for funding, whether that's disease specific um, organizations or grants or different elements, it, it, different avenues that you can find for that because those aren't coded for reimbursement. Exactly. All right. All right. Um, here we talk a little bit about um, what is this process like? So, um, where can you find your resources and your support services? Communication is critical in knowing what funding you're able to receive. And I say it doesn't hurt to call and ask. Um, it may be slightly painful. I've had to do it for family members as well. And um, either the wait on the line or um, trying to get to someone who is that insurance expert that'll take the time can be difficult. Don't be um, deterred from your yeah, don't give up. Yeah, don't give up. Don't be too frustrated. Yes, you can throw the phone or do something like that because I may or may not have done that on a time or two. But you are, uh, or your family member who is seeking out that are your best advocate. And unfortunately, in some regards, I feel like we have to really um, elevate the advocate role to the patients as well as their caregivers and say, you have a say to go learn about. Um, what what things are covered because you may get some no's in places and this gives you the definitive line in that um, as tom mentioned before contacting your social worker for more um, direct and specific resources is vital it's vital for a, a link to those resources they have insight um, generally um, into some of your more specific disease um, i want to talk a little bit about that well, okay again. yeah go um, ahead yeah so remember if you have insurance, um, you, you're paying for that insurance. You're, um, if you have Medicare, nobody's given you Medicare. You paid for your, your entire life. You worked your entire life and paid into the Social Security Administration. So um, when you're calling, it, it, Katie said it so beautifully, you have to be an advocate for yourself. And it is frustrating and it is gonna take time. Um, I don't know if anybody's called the Social Security Administration in a while, but it takes time. And so you have to advocate for yourself and that you're paying for their services it's not something free they don't owe you anything you're paying for that um and you have to be your best advocate so and then connecting there at the bottom just remembering that um you tom as an atp do this all day every day figuring out what's covered and what's not he's seeing that and he can um help you uh see what pieces of equipment are covered and give you some guidelines on that too so it's a really good source. So here we go. Um, advocacy strategies navigating the appeals process. Mm -hmm. um, so first of all, patient usually gets the notice of denial first, and that that typically comes even still today by snail mail. Um, mm -hmm. Every now and then you might get an email, but pretty much they're going to mail you what's called an EOB or an explanation of benefits through the mail and it's gonna be very thick and it's gonna probably be about 15 pages long. And the very first part of it is tell you why was that piece of equipment denied? Um, there could be many reasons. I think I told you a little bit about where Medicare actually approved the chair and you know 80% of the components, but they denied two or three specific things. So that being said, first of all, don't panic. This is what we work with all the time, every day. Our job as ATPs, as a company, is to actually work the denials and get that taken care of. So contact your ATP as soon as possible. They, if you notice on the, mostly on all the EOBs, especially if it's a denial, and you look at the CC part on the last page, they've copied your physician, and they've also copied your equipment company, right? But it almost seems like they mail ours uh, a week after they mail the families or the beneficiary. So contact your ATP, because then we can get the process started quicker. Um, the ATP works with the PT or OT to, for added justification based on the denial. And what does that mean? Well, maybe go ahead. More paperwork. You want to, yeah, more paperwork. Yeah. So, <laughs> which you're worth it. Um, you're worth us figuring out ways to um, yeah. explain and justify that need. And sometimes it's just a rewording as well as a um, 
another measure um, of, of function or status that could be helpful and we're willing to um, push through that to put that back through. Don't give up on a denial and say you're done. We've got ways to, yeah. to work with that. And, and some, sometimes, sometimes a denial can actually be nothing to do with the medical justification. That is perfect. But maybe something wasn't, uh, a T wasn't crossed or an I wasn't dotted or a box wasn't filled out properly. Well, they're going to send that back because a lot of times the reviewers sometimes are not even medically trained people. They just have a checkbox and they're just looking for all the things that they're supposed to look for. And that's okay. That's how the world works. But, um, but do not give up. And of course, you see the last box on there. It's called peer to peer. And what does that mean? So a lot of times when you get a denial, one of the first things is that the physician, whether it's your neurologist, your PCP, your PMNR doc, they could actually call the medical director because a denial can only be signed off on by the medical director of that particular insurance company based, you know, sometimes that doctor might not have any experience whatsoever in power mobility. Um, and so, but they still have to sign off on that. And so your doctor can have, can arrange a phone call with the medical director and maybe give them a little bit more insight on what, why this piece of equipment is needed and all the different things that we put on the equipment is needed. Mm -hmm. So, and that is something that the, the, uh, your mobility company will take care of setting up and getting all of that arranged. It's not something that you have to do. So, um, I think that's, I think that's, that's our really last slide. The basic, you know, kind of the skeleton view of what things, um, take to be covered. And so I'm sure there's some questions um, and some we may be able to answer in the time and some may be more complicated. Um, but hopefully that gives you an understanding of just the basic um, journey that it takes to get equipment covered and what your part is in that process. Absolutely. Good job, Katie. You too, John. <laughs> to both of you. Thank you so much for that informative presentation. Um, I'm going to take over and share my screen now. Okay. Can you just confirm that you can see that? Mm -hmm. Perfect. Um, so we're going to go ahead and just take a couple more questions. Like I said, some were submitted uh, upon registration. So let me just get to this here. <clears throat> okay. So <laughs> How do you get a rotating air mattress approved by insurance? That's a great question. Um, so rotating a lateral rotation, what that what does that mean? So first of all, number one, you have to have a hospital bed already, or you're actually getting a hospital bed at the same time. So um, lateral rotation, Medicare, and we talk a lot about Medicare because Medicare is the government. Medicare is CMS. Medicare does all of the work, setting all of the LCDs and all of the other insurance companies. They kind of tag along with that and they use their LCDs as their coverage determination. So that way they don't have to have a whole department to write them. All that being said, um, a, a lateral rotation mattress, you have to have some type of pressure sore um, already evident to be able to um, qualify for that. Um, and they they are they do have a billable code they do have an lcd and they are covered but if you don't have a pressure sore then you will not get one of those um katie could write the best lmn for that letter of medical necessity and it still will not be covered um you have to have a pressure wound diagnosis from the physician um, hey tom can you define that too i'm not sure about this and need clarification does that mean you have to have an open wound or does that mean a pressure area consistent redness or something that is telling of pressure great question um different types of mattresses because there's there's group uh support support surfaces one supports surfaces two three and four so each one has their own set of rules the the the, the least one if you have a stage one which is redness, um, and it cannot be corrected um, just by offloading, then you do qualify for some sort of support service. More than likely, it will not be a lateral rotation. Um, there's a, uh, in the uh, pre-registration pre questions, I tagged a company called SafeBed. I put a link up there for theirs. They have one of the best lateral rotation beds, um, very expensive, but it's just, you know, I think our job sometimes is not, our job is not to, our job is to give information and, you know, let the family decide how they want to proceed. So that's a good question. Thank you. 
Um, looks like we just got another one in the chat. Is the list of requirements to justify each covered item class public published publicly? Could be the LCD codes. Yeah, if you if um if you just Google uh, Medicare LCD mattresses, you'll you'll find something yeah. you'll find something in there. And if you if you can't find it, just shoot me an email and I'll I'll send you the link for it. So. <laughs> Um, okay, thank you. And then next question is, uh, this person would be interested in services for those in nursing facilities where insurance slash Medicaid does not do anything extra, like charitable options, if you know of any. So, I, I can, I'm going to talk about the state of Texas, because in each state, um, they have different rules about funding in nursing homes. And so, in the state of Texas. Um, and this is the way above my pay grade, but we have specific ATPs that work with nursing home uh, residents. Um, there is funding source for DME inside the nursing homes, even group three power wheelchairs. Um, so you would you would really have to check with your state local organizations or contact an ATP of a company in your state, and they could give you a much much better um, description than what I just did. I felt like I didn't do that very good, but but it's a it's a whole different set of rules and regulations on how that um, equipment is obtained. I know in Texas, you have to be an ATP to be able to work inside a nursing home as well, so. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, do you have information about coverage for patient Hoyer lifts? <laughs> um, so, there is a LC. I, mean, I know I said this a million times, but just just Google Medicare LCD for Hoyer lifts, and you'll find all the coverage determination there. A check with your local ATP, your local equipment provider company, and they'll tell you exactly what is needed. And most of the time, um, if the company is worth its weight, in, then you will be able, they'll be able to process that Hoyer lift for you and get all the documentation they need. So, thank you. Um, kind of going back to equipment, is there a device which can help me get off the floor when I fall? That Hoyer lift can get you up off the floor. It's one of my fun facts and uh, no, demonstrations. No, no, no. Yeah, I'm going to tell you a story. Katie did a Hoyer lift for one of our ALS clients the other day, and the first thing she did was lay on the floor and had the brother of the patient get her up <laughs> off the floor with the Hoyer lift because that's, that's why it was invented in the yeah. first place. It was yeah. not invented as a transfer device. It was invented to pick someone up off the floor. And so... Um, 99.9% .9 of all Hoyer lifts are going to be able to get you up off the floor. Now, you can't use that yourself if you're on the floor. You have to have somebody there um, or you call the fire department and they can get you up. So. Yeah, but having that on hand is helpful too. Yeah, but yeah, <laughs> the favorite tool. Thank you. Um, so, kind of going back to the air mattress, somebody said, I had a pressure sore. So I got an alternating pressure mattress. Eventually it wore out, but insurance wouldn't replace it. Any suggestions? No, yeah. I guess the question first would be, did you seek out um, therapy input for any letter of medical necessity to justify that or um, documentation of continued, you know, pressure issues? That would be the first question to me. Um, yeah, I, it's um, it's not that I've never seen a pressure mattress wear out, but it is pretty rare. They're pretty sturdy. And the interesting thing about insurance companies is they have what's called uh, lifetime usable years. So most most of everything has a five year rule that it's going to last five years, and after five years you can get another one. It, that, that's the same way with power mobility. Um, and so that so so a, I don't, I don't really know what the right way is, but what Katie said was absolutely perfect. Um, did, did we, did we seek out letters of medical necessity from a therapist to justify why you need it? And if you still have it, so. Or doctors. I'd be curious to see, yeah. answer how long, how long, did he say how long he had it? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, if you had it a year, then that, you probably need it. There might be a warranty on it or something. So if you had it 10 years, well, it probably was due to wear out, so. Nine years. Ooh. Oh, not yet, yeah. yeah. You should, my dishwasher yeah. to last a lot longer than it did. Yeah, you should no, be able to get another funny, one. But so. yeah, you should be close to that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, I have another one here. I would like to understand how to present to insurance, how to get my insurance to understand what I need. Well, I think that we kind of covered that in most of this is that 
the, your team, um, whether that it, that goes from your doctor to your therapist, to your social worker, to your equipment provider, all of those play a role in communicating to your insurance company. And I think sometimes people jump ahead of that, trying to, um, you know, because of access to clinics or access to their physicians or whatever it might be. And the reality is these providers, the funding sources require information from those, those um, doctors and therapists and all of that in order to get, get you funded. So in, I mean, I think I went around about that, but talking no, it, to your it, insurance company, I think the perfect. reality is you need yeah. um, all the advocates that you have yeah. um, in a therapy team. Um, and that is where you need to start there. Yeah. Great. Uh, we have another question here. I am looking for a flexibed, uh, one that moves vertically up and down as well as head foot raises would like something would something like this be covered by insurance? No, the flex bed is, is a beautiful piece of equipment. Um, it can sit you in a standing position, reverse Trollenberg position. It, um, it's not it's not covered by insurance. Maybe the VA, maybe some maybe some state Medicaid's might cover it, but Medicare does not. Medicare does not cover that. No. All right, and then I think we have one more question, and then we can wrap up for this evening. It looks like we might finish a little early. Um, can we can we get covered power chair with standard option can we get can, a say, power chair say it's, in the, it's in the chat if you can okay. see that yeah. can we get a covered yeah. power chair with standard options yeah um, so um you might be talking about um you heard a lot of the terminology called group three and that's the complex there's also a category called group two and sometimes sometimes in the industry we just call them jazzies even though that's a that's a manufacturer um, and it basically, or what we call sit and drive chairs. So you turn it on, sit down and you drive, um, has a captain seat headrest and usually a foot plate to rest your feet on. Um, and that is definitely something that is covered by insurance. Um, if you look under Medicare, uh, power wheelchair LCD, um, you'll see that it's in there. Um, and it's called a group group two power wheelchair. So. Perfect. Thank you so much. Oh, you know, I just had one thing. Somebody had talked a little bit about seat elevation coverage and MDA was so, uh, such a huge part of getting that funded by their work on the Hill. Um, and in April of 2020, uh, 2020, geez, <laughs> April of uh, 2023, they started covering, um, seat elevators. And so now they are actually covered by every, um, insurance company, uh, in that's that we have out there. So. Yeah. A huge debate. Right. That's good to hear. <laughs> it is. Um, oh, it looks like we got one more. So someone's due for a new power chair in 2025, March 2025. Will the elevator now be covered by my private insurance? Absolutely. Yes. yes. Yeah. That's Great. awesome. I know. I think it's those things that are encouraging to us. It took took a long time. And we, you know, had many grumbling conversations over why is this not, you know approved as necessary and reasonable and so it's nice to see something did change it's really Absolutely. encouraging yeah yeah that is good to hear well um i don't see any more questions so i'd like to thank you again tom and katie uh we sincerely appreciate your time and expertise and everything you do for the neuromuscular community welcome oh it's really our, really our pleasure um we've enjoyed this yeah. um high five <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Made it through. Yeah. <laughs> the boring one. No, it was a great Harder presentation full of very valuable information. So thank you so much. Yeah, just to reiterate. Just they can, oh no, go ahead. Just to reiterate, they can um they can email us mm -hmm. with any questions they have. Um and it, you know, it's very important um that you ask questions because that's the only way you know. And this is what we do for a living. And there is not a stupid question because I've asked all of them in my lifetime. <laughs> There you go. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Uh, all right. So I just want to uh, make sure everyone is aware that tomorrow we have day two of our equipment and assist assistive technology series. We will have present presentations from Ryan Rausch from the AT3 Center, who will be here to discuss adaptive technology. 
And we will round out our series with Anne Hegberg from Strive for Independence, who will discuss adaptive driving. We will have Q&As with both presenters, so please join us live tomorrow at 4 p.m. If you're new to MDA and have been diagnosed with a neuromuscular disease under MDA's umbrella, or if you or a loved one uh, is someone of someone who is diagnosed, we encourage you to stay engaged with us at MDA. You can do so by visiting mda.org slash join and completing a short form. Joining is free and will keep you up to date on the latest research, educational programs, and supports. MDA has ongoing webinars, virtual learning programs, and live events that may be of interest to you. Be sure to check our webpage frequently by scanning the QR tab at the right of your screen or visit us at mda.org slash care slash community dash ed. Um, MDA engaged symposiums are coming up. As you can see here on the screen, they are half day multi-session programs with both disease specific learning and general learning sessions that are applic applicable to all neuromuscular diseases. Each engaged symposium provides up-to-date information from experts in the field, empowering learners with actionable information to support their or their loved ones care and life goals. Attendees will also have the opportunity to connect with other individuals and families impacted by neuromuscular disease and explore exhibitor booths to learn about different resources. Engaged symposiums are free to attend, but registration is required. If you need help with, um, with traveling and the cost of traveling, you can apply for a travel stipend. So um, you can email us directly with information about that or contact the MDA Resource Center. If you are interested in attending our Dallas Engage Symposium on November 9th, that will be an opportunity to see Tom and Katie again in person. Uh, we would love to hear your comments about today's webinar. Once you leave the webinar, a web page will automatically pop up with a short survey about today's webinar. Completing the survey will provide us with important insights as we plan for the future of educational programming. If anyone has questions after this webinar, please feel free to contact MDA's Resource Center at 1-833-ASK-MDA-1 or email resourcecenter at mdausa.org, and they'll get back to you in one to two business days. Thank you again, Tom and Katie, for your time, and thank you to everyone who attended today. This concludes today's webinar, and we hope to see you tomorrow at 4 p.m. to continue this series and talk about adaptive driving and assistive technology. Thank you so much, everyone.